If you guys are studying for your NASM CPT exam, then no doubt you've come across chapter seven and maybe been like, holy cow, there's a lot going on here. And this is some really deep science concepts. Probably the most common questions that we get from students come from chapter seven. But don't worry, we're gonna make your life easy. We're gonna go through the top 10 most important concepts that you gotta memorize, you gotta master in order to do well on the NASM exam so you can get on to training people. Let's dive in. Number one, the first topic you need to know inside of chapter seven is you need to really understand anatomical locations, anatomical movements, as well as planes of motion. I kind of categorize that as one thing because they all really tie together. Thankfully for you guys, you can find some additional links inside the description of this video that go a little deeper on those specific topics, but you definitely need to make sure that you spend time understanding and being able to visualize things like abduction, a deduction, flexion, extension, as well as understanding what planes of motion those different things happen in. Not only are there gonna be questions that come up on your exam, but honestly, it's gonna help you problem solve a lot of other things as you're trying to get through this NASM certification. Topic number two inside of chapter seven is making sure you understand the full muscle action spectrum, different types of contractions. Now, don't get too caught up on the differences between isotonic and isokinetic. It can be helpful, but really we focus mostly on what we call isotonic muscle contraction. That's gonna be your eccentric and your concentric contractions, which thankfully again, for you guys, we've got another video for. So some of these things you guys can check out the description of the video and go deeper on, especially the difference between eccentrics, isometrics, and concentric muscle contractions and why they're all valuable and even how to use them. But outside of that, as far as isokinetic, all you really need to know for isokinetic muscle contractions is they don't really happen inside the gym. Isokinetic is going through a fixed speed of contraction, and oftentimes you'll find that maybe in a physical therapy clinic with a much more expensive piece of equipment. But what's gonna be helpful for you guys, especially as you guys are trying to better understand eccentric and concentric and isometric contractions, is you gotta be thinking about this stuff while you're in the gym. As you're going throughout this process and you're studying, you're trying to solidify the information, every exercise you do, is it an eccentric contraction or where is that eccentric? Where's the isometric and where's the concentric? And that's gonna help you master the full muscle action spectrum inside of chapter seven. Topic number three you guys need to know and master is going to be understanding muscles as movers. The differences between an agonist and an antagonist as well as synergists and prime movers. A lot of terminology that surrounds movement and exercises and the muscles that are involved. So keep in mind, no matter what the exercise is, we always have this agonist and antagonist relationship. Easiest way to think about that, you got a good guy, you got a bad guy. If I'm trying to do a bicep curl, who's gonna be the good guy? Who's gonna be the agonist? The biceps brachii and the opposing muscle group is gonna be the triceps. Sometimes that gets a little bit more complicated when we're thinking about pushing and pulling exercises, but we always have this agonist antagonist relationship. The synergistic muscles, synergy, think helping, these are the muscles that may not be the prime movers, but they're gonna be assisting and helping. Oftentimes, in a pressing exercise, based on our arm position, the triceps and the deltoids may be synergistic muscles that are helping the exercise. And then outside of that, we always have stabilizers, and it's arguable that all kinds of muscles are stabilizing at one time, but when we think more movement specific, like with pressing, for example, that's where we get into thinking about the muscles of the rotator cuff as those stabilizer muscles that are helping to control joint motion. So make sure, again, you run through these scenarios in your head so you can identify in different exercises what's the agonist, what's the antagonist, what are the synergistic muscles, and what might be the stabilizers. The fourth topic can sometimes be confusing for some people. This is open versus closed kinetic chain movements. And as deep as you really need to go on this is understanding that there's going to be a difference even though when I'm doing a squat or a lunge where what we call our distal, right, furthest away from the body, my feet, this distal portion is connected to the ground, I'm working the quadriceps. Well, when I do a leg extension, I'm also working those quadriceps, but the distal portion, right, that foot on my body is not fixed to an object that creates some differences in stability. And that would be the difference between an open kinetic chain exercise and a closed kinetic chain exercise. If you guys want a deeper description of this, check out the link in the description for this video and you guys can dive further into open versus closed kinetic chain exercises. 
The fifth concept that you need to know inside of chapter seven is going to be the length tension relationship of our muscles. And this is one we could go really, really deep on, but the simplest way you can think about it is that throughout our range of motion, right? If I'm thinking about a bicep curl, I have a different amount of overlap, right? When you guys learned about actin and myosin, actin and myosin cross over one another during that sliding filament theory. Well, there's a certain point in time where they have the optimal overlap. And for most of our muscles, it's somewhere around this mid range of motion. If I'm fully elongated, I don't have enough crossover of those actin and myosin. If I'm fully contracted, I have too much. So somewhere right in the middle, we're strongest. That means during a range of motion in an exercise, there are certain positions where we're supposed to be strong. This comes into play with the overactive and underactive muscles for NASM because the theory behind that is that if we have overactivity or underactivity, it may actually be shifting where our link tension relationship is strongest in the muscle and that can cause some problems. So spend some time with that concept. It is very important, but it's also one that's easy to get caught up on and get confused by. Easiest way to think about it, certain range of motion where we're strongest throughout that link tension relationship of the muscles. Number six, reciprocal inhibition, and kind of in parentheses, altered reciprocal inhibition, because sometimes they're confusing. Really important concept to understand, because it really encapsulates a lot of NASM's approach towards overactive and underactive muscles. Reciprocal, right, kind of meaning opposing. Inhibition, inhibit. So it's inside of the word, but this is this concept. When I'm working a certain muscle, right, through the bicep, then reciprocal inhibition, my body is smart, my central nervous system wants to down-regulate the antagonist, right? So if I'm working an agonist, my nervous system down-regulates the antagonist. That makes sense. I don't want my triceps working while I'm trying to do a bicep curl. Now, altered reciprocal inhibition is when this is happening because of some overactivity or underactivity. Really quick example for you guys. If we've got a client who's got overactive, not just tight, but overactive hip flexors, rectus femoris, iliopsoas, and it's pulling them down. Maybe they sit a lot when they're at work and they go to stand up, they've got overactivity. Well, that's a small amount of muscle contraction. So altered reciprocal inhibition means that since I have some signal going here, guess what's happening to my hip extensors, my glutes, right? They're being down-regulated. They're not turned off like some people might say, but it is impacting the amount of contraction that might go in there. So that's your simple breakdown of altered reciprocal inhibition versus reciprocal inhibition. They are the same thing, but the altered is just a specific example of when that might happen with some sort of movement compensation or impairment. Number seven is our stretch shortening cycle. This ties into a little bit of our understanding of muscle spindles, but the stretch shortening cycle has to do with the fact that when we go from a rapid eccentric, let's say I'm doing a kettlebell swing, and we have this rapid lengthening of the posterior chain, that takes us from a rapid eccentric to a rapid concentric, what happens is a stretch shortening cycle actually gives us some additional contraction and explosiveness because of those muscle spindles, right? Over time, if we're trying to enhance that explosiveness, we wanna minimize the time between the eccentric and the concentric, but it also requires a lot of stability. There's a lot of force generation that's happening there, which is why some of our plyometrics and our explosive training methods come a little later on inside the OPT model. But that concept of the stretch shortening cycle and how it plays into your muscle spindles and athletic styles of training is really important because it's constantly happening as we go about changing direction. Topic number eight that you really need to have at least a decent understanding of is the force velocity curve. Now thankfully again, we went a little deeper on this topic on a separate video, but it's understanding that there is a relationship between the speed of contraction and how much force we'll be able to generate. And it's actually different if we're doing a concentric versus an eccentric muscle contraction. When I'm doing a concentric muscle contraction, let's say I'm at the bottom and I'm driving up from a squat, right? Based upon how fast I'm moving, my ability to generate force is going to go down. Now, different from that during eccentric contractions, the faster I'm going, right, the faster I'm going through that movement, the faster I get into that eccentric, the more force that I can generate. That's kind of a hard concept to grasp and one that I find for a lot of people ends up playing a bigger role as you may work with an athletic population and you're playing with some of that force velocity curve, but it's still a valuable concept that often comes up on the exam, so make sure you guys review that force velocity curve. Concept number nine inside of chapter seven that you need to know for the NASM exam is actually the muscular systems of the body. This is an updated addition 
to the seventh edition materials, meaning that this was not something that was talked about in the same way in previous versions of the NSM course. I like that it's been added, but it's also some much higher level thinking about how our muscles start to work together and the fact that our body really generates force across the body and not just in individual muscles. So I say that this is really good stuff, but stuff that may not make a ton of sense until you're in the game and training for a little while. So how deep do you need to go on these? You just need to understand as you go and you look through different things like our local system, our anterior oblique, our posterior oblique, right? That lateral subsystem of the body. Make sure you have a decent understanding of what muscles belong inside those systems and just try to pay attention to what the primary role of that system might be. What's the purpose of? because they've identified these muscles and these groups as working together to create some synergistic motions throughout the human body. So I think it's cool that ASM added this stuff to the material, but it is some kind of higher level thinking, so don't get caught up too much as you go throughout trying to just recognize which system is what and where those muscles belong. Topic number 10 out of the top 10 things you need to know inside the chapter seven for the NSM exam is gonna be understanding torque, and especially as it relates to the different lever systems, all right? This is a lot of physics and biomechanics that if you understand this stuff well, it will help you be a much better coach and trainer and it's little stuff that ends up coming up on the exam. So what you need to know inside of here is that most of the force, all of the force that gets generated inside the human body is torque and torque is all about rotational force. If you guys find the equation for this, it's torque equals resistance times the lever arm and a lot of it has to do with how far away resistance is from our axis of rotation. That's the simplest way you can think about it. So when we're thinking about something like a rotational exercise, right, the axis of rotation is gonna be our spine or straight down through our body where we're rotating. And how far away I might have that band or cable is gonna have a big impact on how much force gets put into my core, right? Closer to my body, shorter lever arm. Further away, longer lever arm. So you can apply that in a lot of different ways. And as far as that goes with our different lever classes, the easy thing for you guys, although there are class one, class two, and class three levers, almost the entire human body is class three levers, which you'll find as you guys review the material are actually kind of mechanically inefficient. The good thing about that, that's actually why it's pretty easy, even with relatively light external loads and dumbbells to get muscles stronger. We can overload them because our limbs end up being these long levers that generate a lot of force. And there are very few examples of class one levers. One of those is gonna be, you'll see inside the material, how the weight of our skull and the muscles that support our head work. Class two levers is the concept of like a wheelbarrow, right? Where you're able to lift a lot of load. That's actually one of the reasons that if we understand the ankle and the calf, why we are so strong down there with like calf raises and explosive motions, because it's one of the only class two levers that makes us very efficient mechanically. So inside of that, just make sure you understand the concept of torque and then you can apply class one, class two, and class three levers to the exercises and movements inside the human body. And we got a little bonus, ding, ding, ding for you guys. A little bonus concept that's really inside of a lot of chapters, so it ties into chapter seven, and that's just making sure you really understand proprioception and how Golgi tendon organs and muscle spindles really fit in to this picture and process. But again, lucky you, we've got a pretty cool practical video that breaks this down for you guys as well. So hopefully going through and at least seeing these different concepts, there's so much inside of chapter seven, I know it can be hard to figure out like what do I actually need to know, what's important. So we just wanted to break down these 10 that we went through already in this video are the most important concepts you need to master. Some of them we've got some resources for, some of them you just need to go back and review inside your material, but hopefully this can help you focus on the material and the right stuff as you're going throughout your study process. And if you guys got some value from this video, which I'm sure that you did, make sure you guys like this video, subscribe to the channel, and check out the description below for a little bit more information if you wanna dive deeper beyond just chapter seven and get access to our full in-depth study guide or even jump on a call with one of our advisors to figure out what you need to focus on to not only get through the certification, but get on into the industry and start helping clients. All right, I'll see you guys in the next video.